Right, we all seated. We will find the new chair. Not at all as Gary. Right, good afternoon everybody. This is a session about independent learning. Uh, Gary and myself, hopefully you're going to have an interesting afternoon with you. Um, we want to cover, actually this morning was brilliant. I thought Deborah Zachary was really good and very interesting. And hopefully as we talk through independent learning this afternoon, you'll see just how well everything she said feeds into what we're going to talk about this afternoon. Um, the aim of the afternoon um, is firstly to take that term independent learning and make sure that we're all in the consensus of what we're talking about. Because if we're not all of the same consensus, then together we can't really. So uh, independent learning conjures up all kinds of ideas in people's heads. So Gary's going to take us through the first bit, but actually sort of thrashing out a definition of independent learning. So that's going to be really good. Then we're going to look, once we've established what it is, we're actually going to have a look at what the research tells us about why we want to develop independent learners. And so we're going to have a look at that. Uh, the next stage is what it might look like in the early years. So we'll have a look at some, hopefully, some interesting slides and actual, see some actual children up here. And then we're going to, Gary's going to take us through key stage one, two, and three, and beyond. So today, the exciting thing is we're going to start to really think about that, the real benefits of all through learnings. I mean, way back six years ago, when I first got involved in this uh, academy project, the exciting part about it is the fact that we can actually get hold of this idea that to make a difference to our learners at the end, if they're going to be more aspirational and we're going to raise standards, we actually have to really look at where they start and take that right through to the top. So this is quite exciting to, to start thinking about that this afternoon. Um, so we're going to look, about, uh, look how it actually looks in practice and then we're going to invite you all to think about your own environments now and also um, in the future. Some of our environments in the future are a little bit unknown at the moment, but we know that we're all moving on. So I hope this afternoon we can start to think about how our environments, both now and in the future, will be enabling for independent learning. And we're going to finish with um, some about 101 tips, but I'll let Gary. That's a Gary thing. I've got a few tips, but that's a Gary thing, so we'll finish on that one. Um, okay, so we're going to start this afternoon, can I yep. that? So I'm going to hand you over to Gary now, we're going to actually start looking at the definition of independent learning. <laughs> okay, so um, this afternoon I wanted to start with an activity that I like to do with all different ages of learners. Um, I'm sure you've all used mind mapping and brainstorming in your classes before. Um, and mind mapping is a great way of getting those initial thoughts out, but often they're about quantity, not quality. And that's what we really want to examine and drill into and get in everything we do is quality learning. So we're going to do a technique to start our session this afternoon called Brainstorm, Distill, Decide. So in your groups now, what I would like you to do is discuss that first question, and it doesn't have to be related to learning. I just want you to write down on that bit of paper, not necessarily as a mind map or anything like that, just words. As many different words you can think of when you hear the word independent. So it might be newspaper, it might be independent today, the film, it might be Will Smith. Just put down as many different words you think of when you hear the word independent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
is which of these sorts could you apply to the term independent learning? So if you just like to star them or draw a circle around them, which of these relates to independent learning? You may choose to add more words at this point. That's fine. <laughs>
Okay, well, we've only, we've only come to the conclusion of what our number one would be. We've said self-assured. Self-assured. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. It's good. Can do attitude. Sort of one. Yeah. We've got other, but not necessarily in order. No, it's fine. Solid foundation of necessary skills. Solid foundation of necessary skills. Should we go further? Fantastic. Thank you, this group. We have resilience, confidence, and creative. Resilient, resilience, confidence, and creative. Self-sufficient, trustworthy. Self-sufficient, trustworthy, and confident. Yeah. 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 Initiative, understanding, knowledge. Experiment, explore, confidence. This group. Plan, define, carry out your own learning. This group. <laughs> Risk taker and confidence. Fantastic, thank you. Has anyone got else? Any, any others that they'd like to share? Empower. That's a lovely word. Fantastic. Jane. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, great words. I'm trying to get most of those down there. So what we're going to look at now on the next slide, okay, is a couple of definitions of independent learning. And what we want to actually arrive at at some point is an IPACA definition of what an independent learner might look like. It's Hopefully by the end of this afternoon we'll be a bit nearer towards that. So some independent learning uh, definitions that we've uncovered, that learning in which the learner, in conjunction with relevant others, can make the decisions necessary to meet the learner's own learning needs. And you picked up amongst your words, they're so working at their own level and from their own interests. And this was a longer one, in teaching and learning. This is, um, this is what learners might look like, independent learners. Learners are active and curious. They create their own hypotheses. You can read it for yourself there. You've got peer interaction, setting goals, monitoring their own progress. We've got the risk taking, that's an important one. And knowing is another important one which we're going to be picking up on during the course of this presentation is the importance of mistakes, uh, being stuck is a really important part of learning. So just some things to think about, and hopefully at the end of the session and over the next couple of days, we will come to an IPAPA definition of our independent learners. Right, so we're going to start to think about why we want them. It's all very well having established what they are, but why do we want independent learners? And again, research-based, why reaching benefits include the obvious one, the one we're looking for, increased academic performance, Increased motivation and confidence, and ability to engage in lifelong learning. Nobody in this room is going to argue with those. I just refer you to this um, document at the bottom here, and we have got handouts of all of these um, slides, haven't we, Gary? But this is that's a really good piece of reading, bit of bedtime reading. It's quite a long document, but it's really, it really does. Um, unpick everything that the independent learning is about. <coughs> that's where these benefits have come from. Now we're going to have a look at this now because the whole point of independent learning is to produce those learners that we want at the end of their journey, the end of Key Stage 3 and beyond. Now older pupils, this is again research based, and as we're looking through these, it would be good if you could all give you a few minutes on your table to chat about all of these different um, skills that pupils are going to gain at the end of their learning journey, what is happening in your environment now to make sure that they're on the path towards that? So older pupils are more likely, if they've come through an independent learning path, to complete courses, to meet deadlines, and so on. I'm going to give you a few minutes now to chat on your tables, look at each one of these, and think in your own environment, what, is, what are you doing? Are you creating the opportunities in your environment now to allow pupils to work towards these end products where they're in? A little chat amongst your table in just a few minutes. Thank you. 
find that this is what they should do. So actually quite different. We're going to look at some nice slides of actual children enjoying themselves, which is all great fun, but the, the point of this first slide is to think about resources, and resources being readily available, accessible, for children to carry out whatever they need to do. These particular children decided they wanted to make a solar system, and in order for them to be independent learners, they needed to know what they needed, where it was, how to use the resources, a whole list of the skills they needed before they could even get to that point. I think we're all aware in this room that the, the greatest structure is needed for the greatest freedom. You know, sometimes it's easy to walk into an early years classroom and to think there's just children everywhere and mess and, and nobody in this room thinks that, but look, it's that common now. But to allow that to happen and for children to be um, being creative and being independent learners, the most the greatest structure has to go in. So these children were accessing their resources. That one's not quite so clear, sorry about that one. But the point of that one is all those children there who can't see clearly, they are all doing something different, they're all following their own ideas, and they all knew where to go for resources and how to use them. Same as the in the previous slide. <laughs> I like this slide. Um, another point about resources, they haven't just got to be there and accessible, 
It's the quality of the resources and the range of resources, and as far as possible, as many natural resources, and also keeping them fresh and interesting. Because if you, I don't know how many people here go to scrap store, and I think we're going to uh, use that as, as a whole in our packer, but to get as many uh, fresh resources every weekly, even, so that children can discover for themselves. The little boy at the far side, his face says it all. And again, another point about resources is that it's not just about children having an idea and going to find the right resources so that they can create whatever they want to create. The resources themselves, if they're chosen carefully enough, can give the children the ideas. This little boy decided he was going to create Saturn because he found a suitable shape amongst the resources he was looking for. So it's another, another thing to consider when we're providing resources in classrooms. If we start to look now at the role of the adult and the child in the classroom, and this is a total relationship between adult and child, and this slide just illustrates children being involved in the planning and working from children's own interests. And I know long, most practitioners in this room will be very familiar with this idea, but this is, this is a project that started the child just put all their the children just put all their ideas on post-its, either drawing or writing, and then sorted their ideas into different categories, and then that's the teachers planning them for the term really. So that's how they move forward. So all their ideas were incorporated. This is a peer peer interaction, and in this one, um, these children were solving a problem about how to make something into a spaceship. And the little boy that came in from the back came in with his own ideas to make a different suggestion and they all took that on board. This one is a working together as well across the age range. We've got a little boy who was barely three, up to age seven. And again, it's learning from each other, the children supporting each other within the classroom, learning from each other. We've got a little clip here um, again, of the child having the confidence and being empowered, we like that word from the, the first part of this session. This child um, that you're going to see now is empowered within the classroom to understand that he would like to read the story, he'd like to be the adult for a while. And you'll see just on the edge of the picture, the adult is there to support, but it's allowing the child to run with that. extending the language about this child's monster and asking the right questions, extending thinking and taking on the next steps. Here we've got adult as facilitator. Sorry. 
Um, these, these children decided what they wanted to make, they had all their own idea, but they knew where to go for help because they couldn't actually physically get the scissors to cut the cardboard, so they enrolled a very willing adult to do it for them. So this is adult facilitating the child's learning in that way. And here's the adult, two adults, supporting children's choices of resources. Again, they're having a look, rummage through for what they need, but they're being supported and guided and taken on and supported in that way by the adults. Yes, another clip to show the, uh, the adult support for independent learning. That particular slide is really important because we all know about the balance of adult and child led. And obviously, that the child was able to be independent, do what she wanted to do, because the previous day she'd had that input from her adult and given her the skills needed. And if you've heard at one point there, she wasn't quite sure, but her the child next to her had showed her how to use the split pin, so that was, that was a good illustration of that as well. Now, how we do it in a lot of the early years classrooms, a lot of you would be very familiar with this, is the plan, do, review approach, which actually fits very well into this morning. Deborah Zachary was talking about the learning loop. And I was thinking this is exactly what plan, do, review is. Outlining the objectives at the beginning, actually doing it, and reviewing and seeing the learning that's happened at the end. So let's have a look at this. Look at what it is, how, how it develops independent learners, and what do the children need for it to be an effective model for learning. Now, no children can come into a classroom and plan their learning in a vacuum. It just, it just can't happen. So much is needed to go and be in place there. Now, I know Deborah said she didn't like the word inspiration, but we've got it on here because the child needs to be feel some kind of inspiration from somewhere, whether it's inside themselves or from something they've seen or heard, to do something within the classroom. And appreciation of boundaries is an interesting one. It's all very well saying, well, I'm, I'm coming into school this morning, I'm going to make, you know, make a Zoom or whatever. Appreciation of own boundaries are really interesting. That takes, it takes a lot for a child to know what their own limitations and possibilities are, and also <coughs> what they are within the environment of the classroom. An understanding of what's needed to achieve the required results. So what resources do I need? How do I use them? Where to go? Who to ask for help if needed? Knowledge of the resources. Previous knowledge. Again, we go back to the adult child led. We're talking here about a planned review session, which is a part of the day. But again, this child, the child who's wanting to plan something very creative and can carry that out on their own, must have a lot of previous knowledge upon which to build, which has gone in previous sessions in the class. Aspiration as well. I can do it, and I can approach. And the right environment for creative thinking. Okay, so the child's plan, what they want to do in this independent <coughs> session, what do they need to be able to actually do it? The most important thing, again, when we're thinking about our environments and as we move forward into different environments, we have to get the space right. We have to have the space to be able to do it, the right areas in the classroom, enough room to do it, or somewhere quiet to move if they need that as well. And they need time, and that's an interesting one, because there's nothing worse than a little child is there making something, and then we've all got to stop now because it's, it's, it's time to do maths or time to do something else. 
and we're talking of the 100 minute lessons as you go for older children up through and that's that's built on this idea that children do need that time to finish what they're doing. Vision of required outcome, peer interaction, we've seen a lot of this, the enabling environment and the adult as a facilitator, this is, this is the role of the adult during this time. And it's the most important time. Here comes the sort of plenary, the consolidation of learning, the establishment of next steps, the monitoring of progress, all those things we've heard about this morning. So the children are sitting and doing some review in groups with adults. <coughs> this is when the extension of thinking happens. You know, what would happen if, how could you have taken that on? Identif identification of next steps. Again, it slots into the children knowing their own targets. This is what I've done, but this is my target for next time. All comes out in the review session. Mutual respect. I think it's, it's nothing nicer than when you have a group of children sitting around and somebody's done something or says something, and the child next door says, well, that was good, well, well done. You know, just amongst that group, it's a nice, it's a nice feeling. Challenge, again, another big word that we need. Again, okay, you've done that, that's great. Next time I want you to do that. Peer interaction, about. development of language, language the key to everything, and this is the key role of the adult through the whole planned review session, but especially in this review. Reassurance, again, you made a mistake, great, glad you made a mistake, that's how you're learning. The right questioning. Confidence to alter strategies, all the things that we've heard all happen in this plan do view setup. Approval. Yeah, just wanted just outlining really the, the practice in early years at Key Stage 1 classroom that is um, actually fulfilling all the requirements for this good or outstanding teaching. So by the age of seven, with the right assistance, again, this is research-based, children can acquire all they need for independent learning. If you have a look at these, just to have a look at a couple of video clips after that, and I'd like to just bear these in mind as you're looking at the following videos, and you'll be able to see all of this happening. I think you'll recognise by the end of Key Stage 1, Children can have all this in place and they're ready to move on in an independent way. <coughs> we'll just listen to a short clip of a few children in a review session and see if we can actually think about that list you've just seen and what you're hearing. Sometimes. 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 Sometim
Really? Your cat sounds very, very clever. What topics were your cat looking at? Well, she was looking at tires, things, and and a little soup and eggs. Oh, I wish I had a cat like that at my house. And you could be all my breakfast and dance. Goodness me! She does sound very fat. Stand up on my front legs. Uh, that leg that she can walk. Really? Oh my goodness! And is there anything else you want to tell us about your morning so far? So what do you think you can do about that after break? I think that's fine after break. I'm sure you will get a chance to choose an area. So, what do you think you might do when you get a chance to choose an area? Fantastic. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. What did you plan to do this morning? Oh, you did your show, didn't you, with a pegboard? And Chloe had done a wonderful pattern. She did. And what, where else might you have been this morning? What other area did you choose? I'm just looking at what you've got in your head. I just, you might be able to guess where else you've been this morning. Oh, and what is this? Tell us all about this lovely hat you've made. A funny hat. Wow, so tell us all about your bunny hat then. Okay. It looks just like a long time, isn't it? Well done, Fred. Oh, yeah. You made this one. Did you make it? Sorry, you couldn't really hear the children very well in a second. But hopefully, just in those few short clips you heard, the children were sort of, you know, recalling what they'd done for the morning. You heard the questioning. You heard them explaining. Like the that last little girl was saying how she'd sorted out the shapes and what she'd chosen to put the eyes, eyes on with. The first little boy was doing his problem solving, he sorted out how it was going to, to fit onto his head. And the little girl in the middle, who's got an amazing imagination, was being drawn out with such creative language. And also she was predicting, she'd sorted out her time, she couldn't finish what she was going to do, so she knew that after play she'd have this time and what she was going to do. So that list that we saw before, which we're going to refer to later, hopefully just in those little clips you could actually see what's going to happen. And Gary's going to pick this up and have a look how it looks in the key and beyond. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so often when we think of independent learning, we initially think of um, early years and foundation stage, but it's a lifelong skill, one that we here today are all applying in our continuous professional development here today, and one that we want to inspire in our older pupils as well as our younger pupils. And um, I want to share to you with these days some examples both from key stage two, key stage three, and also beyond into university and other other areas. Um, but before I do that, um, that one should come up. Um, before I do that, I just want you to share on your table about what does key stage two independent learning look like in your school that you may not have in key stage two in your campus. But talk with the people that have got key stage two. What does independent learning look like in the year five, the year six classroom? Thank <laughs> you. 
done that this morning, both sharing what we think of those words and, this, and the definitions of what we define independent learning as. But you know what, there's so many misconceptions still out there. And these don't come from me, these come from the colleagues I met with Wales, and they go to lots of schools throughout the UK and they've been working in America as well. And these things they still see from colleagues seeing independent learning. They see that colleagues think that independent learning is about... <laughs> And it's really interesting, actually, because when I was trying to find images for this presentation, when you type the words independent learning into Google, you pretty much get pictures like this. Okay. Just pictures like this. Children working in complete independence in front of a screen. And, you know, I can say now straight away that we're, we're really against that here. We're really against that notion of, you know, we're blinking, we're putting them through, just, it's all... It's all straight, it's all completely without a thing. I saw people writing the words alone when we very first started talking about what the word independent means. And independent learning is not about being alone. It's as much about interdependence as independence. It's about those relationships, those collaborative spaces where we learn together and move forward at our own pace, but with the support of all those around us. At the end of the day, we're a learning community. We're all learning together, we're all moving forward together. And I was involved in a project last year that was a Dorset pilot, and because of Dorset cuts and the just complete obliteration of the Dorset primary team, it, it hasn't moved on this year, but it was a project called Designing Learning. And the Designing Learning uh, platform looked at these 12 areas of learning, um, and I'd just like you to just discuss those now. Which of these best describe your classroom at the moment? Best describe the learning that happens in your learning space? Maybe you can tell the person next to you. I'm 
saying that these things are the complete opposite of each other almost, between critical thinking and creative thinking. Are they poles apart? No, they're interlinked. <laughs> and that's the truth of the matter, isn't it? That we don't just develop these things, we don't just use these things, we constantly use both. And it's our professional judgement, that's why we're teachers, or that's why we assist teachers in what we do, because it's our judgement of what we use for what context for our children. It's about developing more than one approach. And I know that as teachers we can become so used to, and I, 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 everyone falls into trouble, I've done it, of doing the same thing, of working in the same way. And it's about exploring things, it's about developing things, it's about trying something different, and it's about making the children feel like it's different, even if it's not different for you. And independence brings it that into that, but also that into the interdependence of working together. So I'm going to share some examples now of um, some ideas that people have actually done. Um, these aren't my ideas; these are from other people and other people's practice. But we're going to look at key stage two, key stage three, and beyond. So the first example is from a year six science class. Um, they were learning about um, different materials and changing materials, solids, liquids, and gases, and different things like that. And they used, um, you may have seen a similar thing before, but a scaffold, a learning ladder, if you will, of a way to aim and to show your work. And they weren't just given that and told, you know, go and learn. They were given a real structure and a real support, but ultimately given the chance to show in what way they wanted to, how they had learned these things. And I'd argue that if you've got children that are already working at level four, level five, they should be knowing about level six and level seven and upwards. We don't want to limit the expectations of our pupils. Um, this is the next piece of work, an example that this class actually did. You can read more about this project at mrandrewsonline.blogspot.co.uk. Hopefully all the links I'm giving today, you can go and find out more about the people behind them. Because we now live in a world where it's so easy to connect with the people that have the ideas. And we can talk and we can drill down and we can find out more information. So this is the first video I'd like to share with you. This is from two year six pupils in the United Kingdom. And this is them demonstrating their learning using an iPad and some video software. Science, what about the building? That's what I'm saying, Josh. Science level three. I can separate a solid from a liquid using sieving. Sieving is a way of taking solids out of liquids. Salt, sugar and coffee all dissolve in water. Compost, sand and pepper all do not dissolve in water. Science level four. Some factors that affect the rate of dissolving are how much you stir it, how much sugar or water there is, and what the temperature of the water is. There is too much salt and not enough water, so the salt will not dissolve. An example of water turning into a gas is when you boil a kettle. Evaporation is when water turns into water vapour. When a solid dissolves into a liquid, it becomes a solution. Science level 5. If you wanted to swim on a desert island, this is how to get pure water from salt water. There is a limit to how much salt can be dissolved in water because there could be too much salt and not enough water. 
Some factors that affect the work dissolving are how much you stir it and what the temperature of the water is. How to use filtering to separate muddy water from green water. The conclusion of the test was the hotter the temperature of the water is, the quicker it takes the substance to dissolve. Science, what about the dolphin, by Thomas M. And Josh, thanks for watching. Now this is not saying that these people are level 5. This is just showing them that they're aware of what a level 5 looks like. This is showing them they're giving them tools and the independence and also the interdependence of working together to move themselves forward, to look at moving beyond what they may be expected to do. This example now is from Key Stage 3. It's from a year, I believe it's a year 8 or 9 maths lesson. I've just got to click out for this one. In this edition of Proven to Work, discouraging pupils from seeking help from the teacher. We'll be seeing how, by using independent groups in class, responsibility for learning can be handed over to the pupils, while aiding assessment for learning. And we'll be hearing from a top expert in educational research, who will tell us why it's proven to work. This year, my maths class has been split into mixed ability groups, and given a number of challenging maths problems, which involve turning data into simultaneous equations. They've been told not to bother the teacher unless they're absolutely stuck. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three lives. Okay? So I'm going to come round and if I answer a question for you, I'm going to put my signature on your piece of paper um, to say you've taken one of your lives. The idea is that you think a little bit more about what questions you want to actually ask me. Remember, three lives. <laughs> I think the students nowadays have become very dependent on the teacher and really what I want to do is I want them to think a little bit more independently and not put their hand up straight away. Had I given them the task without putting that restriction on, guaranteed two thirds of them would have had their hand up within the first five minutes and this has really made them think a little bit more about what they want to ask as well. So we want twice Wendy, how are we going to write that? Twice W is W squared? I think that children don't understand fully when it's led fully by a teacher. I think then they're just learning it parrot fashion. Is it? Well done, you've got it now, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Matt, you're another line. Yeah. Okay. When students are actually talking to each other, they actually explain it much better to one another, and it uh, makes them think a little bit more about um, their learning when they're actually trying to teach it to somebody else as well. So that's one big advantage for actually putting them into groups. Every group except one soon loses a lifeline. The approach means the teacher can assess where pupils are facing difficulty and can bring them together to address a common mistake or misunderstanding. Put your hand up if twice Roger's age is 2R. Okay, put your hand up if it's R squared. A brave man. Okay, it's actually not. The first group of people, the majority of you were correct, it's 2R. When you're squaring... This same approach could be used in other lessons and by adapting the challenges for other key stages. Observing this lesson is Philip Accordingly, Director of the Centre for the Use of Research and Evidence in Education. The thing that the research tells us uh, is that it's really important to hand over control and responsibility to young people and you know, what, she, what, what this teacher has done is quite a creative way of doing that by giving them lives, making it feel like a game, making it obvious they're in control uh, but, but putting them in a position of making choices about it and I think that was really smart how else can we write this so that we can solve this problem? The risk with that, the research would say, is that she might not get a window into people struggling as it's going on, but in fact that, that has been the case, and so where they really are calling for help, it's because they're really need out and because she's set them very challenging tasks, when she gets called in, she gets called into the real issues and when she's found a couple of groups struggling with the same thing, she can call a class together and deal with a common misconception. So very strategic use of, that was a strategy and then really strategic follow up of it in terms of where, where's the problem big enough to pause everybody's individual learning. So that's very smart. 
For more information on using independent group work and the research connected with it, go to the Teachers TV website. Let's give an opportunity to break and uh, have a chat over tea and coffee. If we could um, get our drinks and be back in our seats for ten past, be at nine. And um, it'd be interesting to think about those um, skills and attributes that we were looking at earlier on, which older pupils are more likely to have. Um, it would make sense, obviously, that if children have more experience of independent learning and become greater at it as they move through the school, that these, these issues would diminish as they get older and older and as they take those skills with them. And obviously, that's where we sit in such an exciting opportunity with an all-through school with that, with that, and without that change into year seven. You know, that continuous sense that we're in this together and through. Now, what does this look like beyond school? What does this look like in industry, in university? Um, I had a little think about this and came across this video from Nottingham Trent University. And there's some really key words that get pulled out here. Some of the words that we mentioned this morning um, that students need to be successful at this level. how to do it and why it's important. So first of all, what does independent learning mean for a university student? Independent learning makes a huge part of the uh, university student experience. It's not time tabled in, so you have to organise it yourself, but it's just you going out and doing extra research outside of your lectures, outside of your seminars, to try and understand more about the subjects that you're studying. All students have a lot more time that's not timetabled, that isn't structured in that way. And that's not time off. And in some respects, the time that you're not in lectures or labs or in the studio is the most important time because that's where you're really making it count. You are taking charge of the way in which you learn and to some extent what you learn. Why is independent learning important? To expand your knowledge, you come to university to kind of be an expert in certain areas. And the best way to do that is they tell you certain bits of information, you go out and you find out more, you read journals, you read your textbooks, you just get a better understanding of what they're talking about and you get better discussions in your seminars if you do that extra reading. Independent learning is an important skill, not just for students, but for work and for life. So um, if I only haven't developed my ability to do independent learning, I couldn't do the job I do now. It's absolutely fundamental. Because it can help change your perception. If you're thought one way and then someone throws out another idea, it can completely change your viewpoint on a subject and make you want to do more reading about what they've obviously been reading. <laughs> what sort of things is independent learning involved in? Whatever way best suits you. I mean, some people will go to the library by themselves, print off journals and stuff. You can get a group study room out and get a group of you in there talking about the subject. You know, some of you can read some journal, some read another, and then talk about key points. It doesn't mean being by yourself. You can find out other people's viewpoints as well, and, you know, getting their understanding so that you've got a better understanding of the subject. You've got to think about your subject when you're out in the classroom. Can you fit it, be it? And the best advice I would say is find a group of like-minded people on your course, persuade them to create some sort of study groups where you just talk about stuff on the coffee. And you do come to those bits of the course where you're struggling a bit. They'll help you not be one fly and one support you and then really they can be more friends for life, basically. Independent learning is at the heart of the university experience. If you get it right, it can be really rewarding. I think the really interesting point there, which she said, it doesn't mean being by yourself. It comes back to the points you've already raised this morning. Um, and it's not just the case in university. Companies embrace independence. They want people that are creative, independent thinkers that think and can carry out a task and can finish it. Google, one of the biggest e companies in the world, 20% of a Google employee's time is up to them. They give them complete independence. 
independence to explore and to find out things that they are interested in, to complete many projects, to complete a challenge. They do that because they know that it's going to greatly support their business in the future because in that independent time, I'm getting confused between independence and independence, that time feeds back into the company and enriches the company in the long run. So what was clear from all these three examples was that good independent learning promotes the development of independence and interdependence. There we go again. It engages learners of any age with the process of learning. What we're talking about here is how we learn. And we all talk about that with our pupils, I know. It's about providing personalisation and choice for the instructor. And it's placing strong emphasis on resilience. We thought, um, Deborah talked this morning about the importance of being able to fail. It's not a problem. It's teaching the children that failure is part of learning. And the word that really jumps out to me is engaging. And I'd like to share with you just some examples of um, some practice that I was involved in last year as part of the Designing for Learning project. I've already shared with you, this flashes for twice for some reason, overemphasizing the point. <laughs> okay, so I've already shared with you these 12 areas that are prevalent in all our classrooms. We want to develop all of these different things. It's not just about one thing. And when we think about independent learning, it just doesn't happen on its own. James already talked this morning about the plan do review process and the way behind designing for learning that I was working with last year um, was looking at learning as part of these five distinct different areas. And the one I want to share with you today is about problem-based learning. How we can present the children with a problem that inspires them and engages them in independent learning. But it just doesn't exist on its own. It develops, it's, it's part of a whole package. You would not do this five days a week throughout the whole term, just you to start learning, obviously. It's about using it when it's appropriate for the task that you're doing. So, what does this actually look like in practice? Well, I was working with the Year Force uh, class last year, where we were, they were set the challenge to share their learning on counts and Romans by creating their own mini museum. They were given very specific guidelines of what they needed to come out by the end of it, but the way they got there, how they learned to, to present that was completely down to them. And we had all sorts of things come out of that. We had displays, we had artefacts made, we had pictures, all completely independent, down to their choice. We had the younger children come and visit, and there's that sharing of learning, that knowledge transfer of being able to share it with someone else worked so effectively. Another challenge was to create their own souvenir as part of the London 2012 celebrations. And here we had children creating ammonites as presentation um, plinths and different things like this, all completely independent, down, left down to them. Here's another one promoting their Olympic and Jurassic sale. And I want to share with you a, minute, uh, a while back at the beginning, I was talking about the new crown jewels, how we designed our own crown for Her Majesty as part of the Jubilee. The fantastic thing with this is we did it both with year one and with year four. And the learning involved, despite the difference in ages, was so similar. That notion of teamwork, that work, work collaborative, that transferable skills, applying their math skills to a real context, measuring the diameter, looking at the, the pattern that we wanted, we asked them to do as part of the crown, looking at all those different skills. And my question now really is, what, when, when you're doing these challenges, when you're doing this real independence, you know, it's probably the highest degree of just saying children, Here's a challenge, you go and complete it as you want to. What is your role then as an adult? What is your responsibility in that class? And I'd like you to just discuss that on your tables now and maybe recall some thoughts in the back of your sugar paper. What is your job to do when you say, off you go, go and create something? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Learning is learning, and um, the role of the adult is, is, is to support the people and to, and to, and to move them forward and, and in that role of the facilitator. And um, I've just got a video clip now to share with you, um, which uses... This is a, this is a problem-based lesson. This is the crown being um, made in a year one classroom. 
But just watch the adults, watch what they're doing, because they're using post notes to record in a non judgmental way the conversations, the interactions that are happening within the group. And then they use bits of fingerings to take the children out of the learning environment into a corridor or outside in this, in this case, and just to share with them, to reflect back on what they've actually been doing. And it's so powerful for the children to hear it's almost someone outside of their little group reflecting on what their group's been doing. It's more, it's more um, powerful than just saying, oh, stop that now, or you do this, and make sure you get involved, and you, oh, you, you haven't done much today, or, or even saying, you know, you've worked really, really well, because that's not coming from them, that's coming from you. And just reflecting back to them, saying, this was said, is this a good thing, is this, is this something we can improve on? This is, I saw somebody sitting on the side, how can we change that? And just removing them from the situation, getting them to think in a slightly different way, it's not something you use all the time, but it's just something now and again to improve that collaboration, that group work, reflection. Another way of doing this, and I found this really powerful last year, is just to video a small section of a group. Um, I, I was on the iPad, I record sort of a one minute clip of the group, and if there's someone that's not being included and they're just sitting on the end, instead of forcing them back into the group or saying to the group, you've got to include him, get them to watch that clip back, just on the iPad, straight away, watch it back, and say, you know, what's everyone doing? And they'll soon notice that Jimmy over there is sat sat there saying, what can we do to change that? And that that ideas come from them, instead of you just forcing it upon them. So here's uh, just a short clip. And I'd like you to just think about, what is the adults, what are the adults doing? <coughs> Making signs. 
somebody who has been given the measurement and it's for a crown, which means surely with your hands where you think you would be measuring that person's head. <laughs> Can you make your pattern just one double thing? No. No? You don't think of it? Okay. Also, I've heard you say, uh, I've got my eyes on the time. Can you use I've got my eyes on the time. Don't work, you said. I'm good? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and a collaborative message here that we're all moving forward together and you know this is something we want to share with secondary as well. Um, because this is what great learning is all about. It's all about being independent, it's all about fostering all those words that you said this morning. I know James didn't put it together at the end um, by putting those words together. But um, I asked people, I sent out I sent out a link, and on the link it said this, can you help? By Packer, we are looking for 101 cloud source ideas and tips. Um, and this is what I got back. I'm not going to share all of them with you, even though there's only 14 of them. I'm going to go through them very quickly, um, because we've got, I love the evaluation forms to write, of course. Um, but the important thing about this is, just like I said at the beginning, all of the ideas that I'm sharing, you can link back into, and we'll hand out the presentation, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides in a minute. Um, but all of these have got a Twitter ID, which you can search. If you've not signed up for Twitter, then do. Um, but you can instantly get their contact, and you can speak to these people and ask them, how is it working in their class? Some of them are great, some of them are crazy, um, some of them are different. And that's, that's great, because that's what we want to embrace. So um, this is from Alan Frame at Blandford, um, down the school in Blandford. The importance of choosing the work you do, but also where you do it is really important. And you know, we're really placing a big emphasis on that as we think about our learning environments in the future. Thinking about using things like Decision Alley, which I'm sure some of you have used before. That idea came in from um, Shelley Blackburn um, from up north. Um, the use of the Wonder Wall. The Wonder Wall is, um, I'm, I'm going to share this as part of um, my presentation tomorrow, but the Wonder Wall is an opportunity, uh, just a space in your classroom where all learners, whether it be teachers, TAs, parents, visitors, pupils, can ask questions and get a response, hopefully. And it's just a way of putting up some post notes saying why, what is, how, when, just putting in questions that then can have just generate discussion. Ideas here is a video, and I'm going to share. I'm going to play this video now, but you can link back to it. Of self-led homework. How often do you give your pupils opportunity to really show their passions in what they do? Because we've got some really passionate people here and want to share what they've done. You know, does your homework support that? Um, and do you celebrate that in your teaching? Do you bring in those things into your teaching and learning? Um, use of Edmodo to, lab, uh, to improve collaboration and learning. Edmodo is the online education version of Facebook. I did a CPV session a few weeks back, and there's a video online about that. Using blogging through WordPress and iPod Touches. So if children have finished their work, they can go onto their e device and find out the next challenge. These are all ideas that people are using. These were referred to this morning the sort of traffic light system. Um, using them to quickly gauge their feedback. I love different. I'm trying to collect as many different colours as possible. But using them in class as children who just stick it onto their work, stick it onto their heads, stick it onto their backs, wherever it may be, to highlight the fact that they're stuck and that they want help instead of just putting it in the hand. Just using different techniques, even if you only use it now and again. This idea comes from Gary Spratman and Paul in the United Kingdom. And this comes back to the point I raised earlier about one to one computing not being the answer. You know, ICT needs to be used in a flexible way when and if appropriate. It's not about using it all the time. This comes from a chap called Stephen Heppel, who was in Adelaide at the time, and he highlights the importance of peer review of work at a draft stage. And um, I did, oh, the other thing I should have mentioned about this is when I send this to you, there's loads of notes that people have made about the theory behind all of these things as well. So they sort of linked off and said why they're doing it, and there's loads of notes with each one. Um, another idea from Shelley Blackburn, different areas of learning, um, sorry, different areas and different ways of learning. She talks about collaboration station, that's where we come together and we work together. So you had a help station when people would go to an adult. Create those areas in your classroom that children can move around and work in different ways. This is my idea. Taking every teaching resource and renaming it as a learning resource. You know, making things accessible, Jane shared it this morning, but making everything available um, using transparent drawers, you know, in the classroom. Don't get things, don't get things hidden away. Make things available. Make things to be able to be seen. Don't have anything in your school that the children can't use. Get them to use a photocopy. Get them to change the in the printer. Get them to have the responsibility over things. Oh, that, that one caused a bit of a stir. Um, messages that alter how getting stuck is viewed by learners. Things like, if you can't fail, it doesn't count. Things like, have you failed? if you fail today, that's great, because that means you're learning. You know, it's, it's instilling that sense of resilience, that sense of a growth mindset that we're not just hit a wall, we're going to go right through it and we're going to progress. 
And finally, you saw it in the, you saw it in the video, ch giving children roles. You know, however minor they may be, however they're used once a year, you know, giving them a sense of responsibility. And it's so often the case that um, in schools it's a top year group. So if you're an infant school, year two is a very grown up because they've got these little roles that they do around school. Um, and then it's often the case in the Jews, might be year sixes or in the middle school, in the first school, it'd be year fours. And there's always that sense of pride and achievement. But if we did that at IPACA, it would just be our sixth formers that had any responsibility because they'd be the top of the school. So it's about giving those roles right throughout. All the people having that roles, that responsibilities, giving them, whether that be in a class situation, a year group, a house situation, or whether it be in a group. You know, I'm a timekeeper today. There were year one timekeepers in that video. You heard some of them say, oh, it's not long back. They couldn't have the time, but they had that sense of, I'm responsible for time. So when I was saying we've, got long, we've not got long left, they all knew that they hadn't got long left, yet their timekeeper went around and made sure that all of them knew that they hadn't got long left, and it's just giving them that sense of responsibility. That sense of ownership. Oh, there is one more. 14, I said there was 14. Share expectations and provide further choice and control. We've already talked today, and uh, Deborah brought up about the importance of learning objectives and success criteria. But don't just limit your pupils through learning objectives and success, and success criteria. Um, I, called a bit of, I caused a bit of a fuss in my last school when I said that good, a good lesson had learning objectives and success criteria, and an outstanding one didn't. And I think that perhaps is going a little too far, but. The notion of, don't limit your children by your learning objective and your success criteria. They can do far more than you can ever imagine. Give them that opportunity to fly with their learning. So, do give them a learning and objective and success criteria, but also say to them, this is what you could do that's even better. Or show them what a bad example looks like. Show them that this would not meet the success criteria, but this excels it. So, will your idea be next? I'm going to share this with you all tonight. I'll send you an email around. This presentation today has been videoed. It's going to go up online. So if you want to look back at any of the points that we've been discussing, you can. Jane's just going to pull this together now. Lovely Jane ending. Thank you. Jane ending. I like that one. Just on this last point, Jane, about the idea of the fifteen. Just to say that it's really interesting to have a chat with somebody at the back there who's had a brilliant idea that I think we're all going to agree with, and that's about having our own strap store on Portland. Um, which is fantastic, so thanks to at the back there. So we're going to start exploring that, about finding someone to have it, someone to run it, and getting um, into all the local businesses, so don't throw anything away, we'll have anything you've got for resources. So we've got, I think we've got idea 15, Gary, already, which is great. Um, today, hopefully, we've all got an idea, we've got a consensus, hopefully, in this room, of what independent learning is. I think it's been really exciting to see that it's exactly the same for a three-year-old as the, that girl that was speaking at university. That was fantastic, what she was saying. And the idea that if we start children at three or four and we work through the whole of their learning journey in this way, just think what they'd be able to do by the time they got to university. It's just very exciting. So I hope you've got a consensus about what we're talking about and why would we want to develop them um, and how we might start to look at our own environments to make them more enabling for that to happen. That was the idea of this afternoon, so hopefully we've got somewhere close to that. I did try and put all those words together into one definition, which was a bit difficult, but I, I'll just read it out and you can put it to bits as you wish. Uh, we want to develop confident, self-regulated learners who are empowered to take risks, explore, experiment and be creative, taking the initiative in their own learning and all within an enabling environment. So hopefully that's pulled together some of your thoughts this afternoon. So thank you for that. And I just got a little message from Karen about tomorrow's IPC session. So in the morning, can you please bring along a paper copy of the IPC unit that you want to do, the skills section, laptop or device for planning. That's for the um, initial session tomorrow morning. Okay? I think that's great, and um, if there are any other areas of improvement or issues or thoughts that have come out or ideas that have come out from this afternoon, please come and speak to myself and Jane now, we'd love to hear them and move them forward. Somebody's already mentioned about the importance of speeding up how we order resources in our campuses, and that's something that we can take for ourselves, it's something that affects everyone, so we can take that forward, and if there's anything else, just please come and talk to us, 
um, or email us if, if, if you prefer to do that. I'm now going to give out the evaluation forms if you can just spend some time with me. They are all looked at.